Legends Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Lab Coat Agents Podcast. And I'm excited today to bring you a, a pretty cool guest. And let me tell you why he's so cool. Uh, first and foremost, he's a husband and father to six kids. That in and of itself is partially crazy. Uh, but you've got to have a certain mental makeup here to be able to survive in that world. I have four, and I think I'm crazy some days. But he, more than that, he's the host of the Think Bigger Real Estate Show. Many of you may have heard of that. And an author of a book called The Upstream Model, which if you keep listening, we're going to be giving away some of those books today. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, Justin Stoddard. And let me add one more thing. One of his favorite things to talk about is building a referral business that crushes big tech competitors. And I don't have to name any names. I think you all know kind of who we're talking about here. If that's not reason enough to stick around, I, I got nothing else. Welcome to the show, Justin. <laughs> Jeff, such a pleasure. One of the coolest intros I've ever heard, by the way. <laughs> Dude, I... I um... I enjoy doing that. And you probably won't believe this, but I literally wing those together uh, with about 30 seconds of just summarizing your little bio. So <laughs> that's fantastic. I guess when you've done this 150, 200 times, it gets easier. <laughs> it's a gift. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, dude, Matt, to welcome to the show. So let's, 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 uh, let's back up and assume that our listeners have, have not heard of you or don't know you. Uh, so why don't you tell us who you are, where you come from and, and what kind of led you to where you are today? I love it, man. Thanks for the opportunity. You know, I live in the um, outside of Portland, Oregon. I don't always claim Portland these days. It's a little crazy place down here right now. But um, I'm in the suburbs of Portland. Uh, it's the most beautiful place on the planet, um, hands down. And uh, my background is I was, I was raised by very entrepreneurial parents um, at a young age. Um, I was actually very young, fresh off uh, a couple of years in Brazil on a church mission, came back and started working at UPS uh, so I could get benefits. Right now you're wondering, like, how does this tie into this? Uh, my dad and, and stepmom at the time said, hey, we should start flipping homes. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll help with the financing side of it. You go in, fix it up. We'll sell it. We'll share the proceeds. And I was earning 15 bucks an hour thinking I was making good money at UPS. All of a sudden, we made 15 grand in like 45 days. And I was like, there's something about this real estate game that's interesting, right? Um, that doesn't always look like that. But my mind shifted. I started to think bigger. I realized like this real estate game needs to be a part of my life moving forward. Um, I went off to school at that point, realized I didn't want to be a UPS driver, um, very much a short-term employment, kind of holiday employment. And I went off to school, um, began studying construction management, was tutored by a high-end home builder, worked for him, kind of scaled up a company and then left and started my own company. Um, did that till 2009, building high-end custom homes. I was 25 years old at the time, looked more like I was 18, thought it would be easy to convince multimillionaires to entrust me with $2 million to build them the dream home because the guy that I had worked for had been pretty masterful at that. And it wasn't as easy as I thought it would be, right? I was a little naive, a little wet behind the ears and uh, realized uh, that I had to be strategic about how I went getting business because it wasn't coming as naturally as I thought. Uh, my uh, kind of the way that I'd been taught is like your, um, you know, your past clients, your friends, your family, they'll be your best referral sources. But when you're friends and family members are, you know, a recently graduated college student, they aren't referring you to high-end custom homes. So I realized I needed to build a new, more powerful network. Um, that led me to really kind of uncover the upstream model. I was able to build a successful custom home business based on what I learned from that. Um, after the market crash in 2009, I was recruited into the title and escrow industry to launch a new division of a Fortune 500 a title company here in the Portland, Oregon market. And I learned that those same principles that I learned in the home building business served me well in my industry. And then I began to teach them to real estate agents. And I realized that there's a lot of people out there that want to build a business by referral. Uh, but oftentimes that, that the network that they have, friends, family, past clients don't produce at the frequency or at the level that they want them to. And so they, they're tempted to go buy leads, but they don't really like that game. They prefer to be warm market. So that's really where the upstream model comes in to teach people how to scale a relationship business and really kind of step on the value propositions of these big tech competitors. So uh, that's where I'm at now. And I'm kind of building a coaching consulting company on the side that serves agents at a high level. The name of that coaching company? Think Bigger Coaching and Consulting. Awesome. So a couple of things I want to unpack from what you just said. Uh, first off, uh, you got into title in 2009 when the market was essentially like still in shambles. 
Um, what was that like? Uh, obviously coming, I mean, cause again, coming out of 07, 08, I can't imagine too many, there was a whole lot of growth going on at the time, but clearly this title company was what, what, uh, kind of, what, what was behind that? Look like, yeah. So there was actually a, a gap there and kind of what I shared. So I closed my business in 2009, ran a regional marketing company outside of the real estate industry. 2014 is when I got into the title and escrow industry. Got so um, I stepped out of the real estate industry, missed it for a number of years, and then was recruited back into it in 2014. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So then uh, you mentioned you use the terminology swim upstream. I actually use that a lot too. And I wholeheartedly believe in it, but I don't want to be naive and assume that everybody knows what that means because some might just be thinking about a salmon right now. Um, and so, and you know, you are, there you are in the Northwest where they probably, you know, are running pretty consistently, I, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, explain what that means to the novice who may not fully understand it, or even somebody who thinks they understand it. What does swimming upstream mean in business terminology? Yeah, I'll give you the example of when I was a high-end home builder is that I was learning about homes uh, that I could bid on as a home builder after that they'd already chosen a builder. Like there was this very crowded pool where all the builders were fishing out of. And it was very hard for me even to get my line in the water, so to speak, to get an opportunity to bid on those homes. They, they were learning about it before me and they just had kind of their section of the river blocked off, right? They had multiple poles in the water. I couldn't even get to the fishing hole. I realized like, how do I learn about these projects before these cats, before these guys that are taking the business? How do I get in relationship with these clients before? And I realized that there were professionals in the marketplace who were dealing with my future clients. And I identified that as architects, interior designers, uh, land developers, real estate agents that were selling vacant lots. These were the people that were in relationship with my future clients. And in order for me to get in contact with them sooner, I needed to build value for these upstream partners because then I would have a head start on building relationship, building value with the clients prior to it getting into that competitive kind of red bloody ocean that we, you know, I've heard about that, that causes margins to drop and people to lose their hair. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, there you go right there. Um, <laughs> I haven't had that for years. So when it comes to, so the way you just described it, which is, which is fascinating and it makes perfect sense as, as a home builder of any kind, actually, for that matter, let alone a high end, um, correlate that to, so as, as the realtor who's sitting or walking on the treadmill right now, or walking outside or driving in the car, sitting in traffic, <laughs> what, what is it, how would you, what would be the best analogy or two or six uh, that you would use for swimming upstream for the common residential real estate agent? Love it. Great example. So I began to uncover this of how, how I could stand out in the title and escrow industry, helping them to get new business. I realized that I wasn't going to be the guy that just won business by being chummy and buying golf games. Um, like I've got six kids, right? I don't have time to be out hanging out in bars with, with people to try and get business. What I'd rather be with seven people that I love the most. So how could during business hours, I provide such value to their business that it was, it was clear where they you know, wanted to send title. And so I began to take these principles that I'd uncovered from the home building business. And I began to apply it um, to my business. Okay. As a title professional. And so um, I realized like, okay, the way that I'm going to do this is these real estate agents, these lenders, they're upstream partners for me. How can I add such value to them? And the way that I did that is I taught them the same principles that I was applying in my business. And so uh, one of the things I uncovered is that real estate agents, uh, their upstream partners really kind of fall into two categories. They're maybe what you call white collar and blue collar, right? Where you've got the professional services, financial services, which could be wealth managers, CPAs, insurance agents, um, tax advisors, right? These people that are dealing with people's money. Then you've got the blue collar, which are the people that are dealing with the house, contractors, landscape, carpet cleaners, painters, uh, these two crowds of people that are dealing with our future clients. Oftentimes before we know that they're going to buy or sell, not always, but sometimes. And uh, I began to interview wealth managers and I would ask them the question. I say, do you know, or like started off by saying, do you have like a consultative relationship with your clients? And if they did, then I proceeded to, to, to ask them these questions. I said, how often do you meet with your clients? It was typically at least annually, sometimes more frequently than that. And I said, great. In those conversations, are you aware, are you uncovering the fact that your clients are going to be making a real estate move? And they said, yeah, hundred percent of the time. Like we know we're looking at their entire financial picture and we're advising them as to what to do um, to, you know, with regards to everything money. And I said, great. Um, how often do you 
uncover that. Like how many of the of your like how many touches per year are you uncovering the fact? On average, it was about 18, about 18 new sales they were learning about each year. I said, great, how many of those are you referring out to agents? And the answer was almost unanimously, none of them. <laughs> it's like, what? So you've got 18 warm referrals that if you pass it to a real estate agent, the chance of closing that business for a real estate agent would be uber high because it's coming from their trusted financial professional. And um, then they discovered, or, or they, they, I began to dig in deeper. Now tell me, again, because I'm not a, like a residential real estate agent, they leveled with me and told me like, Justin, here's why we're not referring that to an agent. Had I been an agent and approached them, they probably would put their guard up. They'd be like, you know, I don't really know when people are going to be moving, right? Why? And this is exactly why they weren't referring is because typical real, like residential real estate agents, as soon as they identify the fact that somebody um, is, has the ability to refer them, they come in with their hand out. They say, let me tell you all about me. Like I'm a really great real estate agent. I take really good care of my clients. I'm in the diamond, diamond platinum, super gold club have been for the years. Here's all my testimonials. Um, here's how I serve your clients. Do you have any referrals for me? And it's very much a me, 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 me conversation. And so, you know, financial advisors um, don't always uh, see an equal value return. They see that they could give a referral, but there's almost more risk in giving that referral than in reward. And I go into kind of depth in that in the book. So I won't, I won't go too deep on it here, but like the concept is, there's opportunities to get very warm referrals, not one a year from like your typical sphere, like maybe you'd get from people in your database, but we're talking like multiple a month, right? The potential. One of my best clients, I've kind of coached through this process. I asked her in June of last year, how many referrals have you gotten from that one referral partner? She said, I've closed 10 deals to date. That was halfway through the year. Now she's built that relationship over, over time, but it doesn't have to be over time. And so um, the kind of the big, the big thing to recognize is that there are certain people, you, you don't have to have a huge database that, that produces a small amount of referrals, right? Now you should do that. But that's not the only way to do it. You can also have a very small database of key professional partners who give you lots of referrals, right? You can really pour big business value into a few people that give you lots of recurring referrals over and over and over. And that's what the upstream model uncovers, financial advisors being one of them. But again, one of the big mistakes people make is that they realize like, oh, that person gave me referrals and they go and they approach it totally wrong. And they kind of kill, you know, they kill the golden goose before the goose ever gives them an egg. So let's talk about that a little bit now that you've, you've opened up that hole, that rabbit hole is, is, okay, so financial advisor, which isn't like, that's not, this isn't rocket science here. Yeah. But at the same token, I feel like, as I'm thinking about it through after you, as you're explaining it, is that it's the same thing in, in mortgage, right? It's like, that's a natural mm -hmm. referral partner potentially, but for whatever reason, I feel like very few effectively execute on that. And is it because of, they don't know how to approach or a poor approach and what is the proper approach? Because again, you know, effectively, as I think about this, you know, you go to a financial planner, you go to a networking event, I'm a mortgage or real estate professional, you have clients, have you thought about referring them to me? I mean, clearly that's a terrible approach, but again, I'm spitballing, I'm pretty eloquent, and I'm not even able to just, you know, other than I'm going to give your client amazing service, which is going to make you look good which is great. Of course, that's to be, you know, you should go without saying, but yeah. that's not going to cut the mustard, no. right? So what would you say? How would you coach somebody into approaching these? Let's, let's go with financial advisors. Jeff, I love these questions. So let me start by this, is that you have to change the paradigm of who you are. They're so ingrained as to what they think real estate agents are and do that regardless of what comes out of your mouth, there has to be a pattern interrupt to where they see you differently. Um, what I mean by that is one, one um, kind of upstream partner for, for me kind of shared this with me. He said, the difference between financial advisors and real estate agents is that we as financial advisors, we don't have past clients, right? We don't have past clients. Our real estate agents do have past clients. And so what I mean by that is you think about the way a, like, a, like a typical real estate agent works. They serve their clients from three to six years, oh, sorry, three to six months, right? And like once they serve that client, they put them on a past client list. They hope to stay in contact with them and get their future business, right? That's kind of what that entails is, a, is, is you've got clients that you serve for a period of time during the transaction. 
And then after that transaction is over, they go on a past client list. Whereas when you're a financial advisor, you don't have past clients. You serve clients throughout their entire life and potentially beyond. And so there's this whole paradigm shift of like, no, we don't even work the same. You're transactional, we're lifetime relationship, right? So part of the big aha is that you have to, you have to cause them to see you differently than they see real estate agents right now. Because the way they see them right now is not somebody who they would refer to because we just work totally different. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you value and, and, and you're not going to be able to give it in return because we work differently. And so one of the first things that I recommend is not to approach the people yourself, but you get referred into those relationships. So for example, somebody else needs to third party endorse you that you're unlike any other real estate agent out there. Okay. So what I mean by that is rather than going and, and approaching someone at a networking event, right. Or at a whatever, right. Cold calling them or a business mixer, whatever, right. Your approach is to say, who is an upstream partner, identify who that person is. And it could be by reaching out to your very best clients to say, I'm looking at adding a financial advisor to my value proposition so that when my clients need that type so, sort of service, I have somebody great that I'm going to refer into my transaction. Who do you recommend? You guys seem like the type of people that would have really great relationships in that space. I'm really interviewing to fill that spot right now. Who should I be talking to? Who's a great financial advisor that maybe you'd recommend that I talk to? Um, and they, they'd probably be honored. You've done a couple of things there. You've, you've offered a high level touch to your clients. You've rebranded yourself as adding more value to the transaction than you used to. And you're asking for an introduction. Now, as soon as they say, yeah, we absolutely have somebody say, great. Can I help craft what that introduction looks like? Cause they might see me as the typical real estate agent and I don't want to be seen that way. And then that, that introduction needs to be something to the tune of that's, ge that's genuine and authentic to, you know, to the person that's offering it, but also needs to be like, this person is does much more than just markets and sells homes. They are a wealth advisor for our real estate portfolio, right? They work very relationally. They, they serve our real estate needs throughout our entire life. You're trying to change that paradigm that we just don't serve this person for three to six months. And it's not just gimmicky, like I'm your realtor for life. Like, no, realistically, they're constantly advising us on what we should be doing with that money that's in our real estate portfolio. And if you can get a, a client of yours to make that introduction to a professional partner. Now, when you go actually take that meeting and reach out and have that conversation, you don't have to try and change the paradigm because your clients already done it for you. They're at least listening differently now. And once you have kind of their attention there, now you can spend that entire first meeting on listening and really evaluating to see if that's a partner that you would want to bring into your value proposition. And the end goal being, how do you add value to their that client experience to their value proposition. Not like, hey, I'm here because I want to get referrals from you. But the conversation is more, um, you know, I've, all of us are being pressed down by big tech platforms, mm -hmm. right? Whether it be Robinhood on their end and Zillow on our end. Um, we all of us need to raise our value propositions. I'm confident I can give you information about the real estate market for your clients that would that would raise your value proposition. I'd also like to get value from you as a financial advisor to where I can have those kinds of conversations with my clients so that I'm more valuable than just another real estate agent they found on Zillow. So each of you have now elevated each other's value propositions. And at the very moment that that financial advisor is uncovering the fact that they have a real estate need in their future, guess who's already in the conversation? It's you because you've provided detailed, you know, whether it be a CMA or some other detailed information about real estate that now puts you right at the top of mind of that financial advisor of like, well, here's who you should talk to. Yeah, I love that. And, and honestly, this whole mindset, which obviously you kind of call it upstream in a way, um, and I like that, is very applicable to really like any networking event of any kind. And, and I, think, I think the shift is the mindset shift to the sales professional to say how I'm approaching these people needs to completely be reconstructed. Yeah. Um, because I think a lot of, a lot of agents, and I, and, I, and I would challenge anybody listening to this, A, if I challenged you, you know, you, you hired me or Justin to coach you. And the first question I ask is, all right, I'm a financial advisor or I am whatever. Um, what's your, what's your pitch? What's your value? What do you, what do you, how are you selling yourself? 
um, I think a lot of them would stumble and not have anything to say. And then another good percentage of them would fumble around with the same old traditional BS and very few, probably less than 10% would actually have a good intro. I won't even call it a pitch because it can't be a pitch. It has to be value, right? Well said. Um, I love that. So give me, give me some other examples before I get off the upstream the conversation. Cause I, I, you've got a lot of value to bring. And I don't want to just, just focus on this, but um, I'll other, give me another example other than a financial advisor. Cause that one seems a little bit more cliche. Give me one that maybe the realtor listening to this is not thinking about. Yeah. And I'll say um, the typical thing is to think about kind of the white collar crowd, right? The, like the, like the professionals, right? The kind of the financial professionals. I mean, lenders, right? That's a very common one. Um, you know, I would say- uh, I think that's a common. bad one, by, just for the record, that's a bad one because the lender actually needs more of you. And so just think about this realtors. And I don't mean to cut you off there, but only because I come from the mortgage world. If you as a realtor go into this thinking, my lender is going to be my referral partner. Yeah, there's going to be an anomaly and there's going to be a handful, but a good LO- has at least 20 to 30 referral partner agents. Yeah. It's not on earthly possible for them to feed all of them. So for you to think that that's going to be a good lead source, my, in other words, yeah, there's much better options. In that well, and people don't go shopping for financing. They go shopping for a house, right? They think, oftentimes think of the realtor first, even though they should be thinking about financing first. The consumer doesn't get fired up about how much can I afford, right? That's kind of a learned experience, unless they're more kind of mature in their, um, you know, in their, and they're thinking. Um, but, you know, it's been interesting as I've, as I've uncovered and began to really kind of think through, and, and I, I work with a group of agents now, kind of a group coaching uh, to, to really help them apply this model. And um, I'll just list out a, a couple here that come to mind. I and mean, builders is, is, is one that people oftentimes think about, but they don't do it very strategically, right? Um, I'll say CPAs, tax advisors, um, and then I'm going to kind of focus on one kind of per your request that maybe people don't think about. They think about like, uh, for example, like a flooring contractor, right? Because typically you're thinking like, okay, if I'm going to get that kind of edified referral, I'm thinking financial services, right? I'm thinking like that kind of like financial professional, which I agree a referral from that, somebody who you've entrusted your financial world to, is going to be a probably better than somebody who they've entrusted their carpet with, right? Um, there's just a higher level of trust there, higher, like higher level of expertise. However, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this example because I want people to think that there really are, there's value from both camps, the financial services, as well as kind of the contractor services. Um, if you get the right, <clears throat> the right contractor, for example, let's say like a, like a flooring contractor, you can get somebody who goes every house they go into, they are not just asking, because again, they're competing with call it the Home Depots of the world, right? Very similar to us. They're competing with these big giants and they're trying to figure out a way how they can stand out. And so if you can train them, and we'll talk about why they would do this, how to incentivize them here in a little bit, you can train them to every time they go into a house, not only are they asking about like, what am I bidding, but why am I bidding it? And I think that's next level conversation about being a consultant in general, is that whether you're a real estate, mortgage, title, like whatever profession you're in, it's not about just the what, everybody covers the what, but it's the why behind it. Because then behind the why, you might realize that they need a different what or that their what is not correct with actually the goal that they're trying to accomplish. They don't know everything you know. And so if you train, let's call it a flooring specialist. Every time you go to a house, they say, okay, great, we're gonna be doing, great, you want wood floors bid here? Tell me why, tell me why, like, do you guys just love wood floors? Are you, are you planning on uh, being here for a long time? Like, in, or is this, are you gonna flip this home and sell it? they can then start to give advice as a flooring consultant, right? To where it's not just about, can you get a better price than Home Depot, which they probably can't, but it's now like, here's what I would do. If you're going to be in this house for another two years, I, I think you're probably okay doing something a little more trendy, right? Um, because if you're going to be here for, for two years, that trend's still going to be in style. Now, if you're going to live in this house for 10 years, then we probably need to have a little bit different strategy about durability, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you're teaching that professional how to be a consultant. And in the meantime, you're teaching them that if they say that, look, we're just doing this because we feel like we're going to get a better resale, we're getting ready to sell this home. Now you've opened the door for them to have identified the fact that there's a real estate transaction in that person's, in their customer's future. And they have the ability now to, to enter in uh, this conversation, which is, you know, to the tune of, um, hey, 
great. I, I totally see why you're doing that. I think what you're doing there is, makes sense. Do you have a real estate professional that just that isn't just good at marketing and selling homes, but do you have somebody who really is expert at getting an ROI on your return, telling you what you should be investing in and what you shouldn't, right? Like whatever that narrative is, you can you could equip that, call it a flooring specialist, with a couple sound bites that ha- helps them be more of a consultant and also helps them to uh, bring you into the equation because now you are helping in- improve their value proposition, helping them get the flooring deal, right? Um, and you're able to now also get them to, um, you know, to, to, to be referred to you if they've got a real estate transaction in the future. So um, I, I would, and I've just kind of pulled that one out of my hat. That's one that often people wouldn't think of. It's like, well, I'm not learning about that in advance of a sale. That's typically what people do after the fact. Not always, right? Not always. It's, it's almost like a double whammy too, because as, as you were describing that, um, my, my first inclination was to say, put myself in the shoes of the floor and say, well, what's in it for me? Why the hell am I going to go through this process? I mean, come on, this is silly. I'm not a salesman. I lay floor, right? And not to minimize that by any means, because Lord knows I couldn't do it. Um, but it it's so you're essentially, there's two things here. You're elevating that floor layer, like that, that, that person, whether they own a company, whether whatever, because and, and you can coach them through this as to say, this is how you can create differentiation from every other company because everybody else is just going to go in and bid it. That's right. And they're going to compete against a, a Home Depot or a Lowe's, whereas that's what Home Depot and Lowe's is not going to offer them. And that's where you can raise the bar. But something you didn't say, um, which I think is probably more natural, but is in addition to is that, oh, and by the way, you know, obviously I'm working with all of these homeowners all the time and I have past customers, right. I'm going to need a good floor layer to refer to them. Exactly. So it's, it's a tit for tat. So um, I think it's more than just the educational piece. Cause I do think a lot of floor layers may struggle to understand that, but dude, I, I love that. I've actually, I've not heard that at any time recently. And I think as a realtor, if you if you're hearing what he just said, now step off the treadmill where you are right now and make a list of all the people that you can basically coach. Make a list of all of the people that you can go sit down with coffee or lunch with and do this exact same strategy. I bet you you can come up with 20 in a few minutes, just like that. And all of a sudden that shifts your referral bucket and, and, and just exemplify, it makes it so much bigger and stronger. Uh, that was powerful. We could technically end the podcast right now. Justin. I think uh, I think we've got it, Jeff. I want to I want to kind of layer on something here. Yeah, is that um, you know kind of, kind of what we promised coming into this is how these strategies would help you defeat big tech, right? And uh, I think, dude, you just read my mind. That was my next question. Anyway. <laughs> Great segue. I love it. I love it. So you think about like why does big tech win, right? When they do, why do they win? It's because they're more convenient and they've reduced complexity. I kind of outlined this in my book, like why is Amazon such a great option for people? Well, they've, they've reduced complexity. It's really easy to buy stuff and they've lowered the cost, right? And I think when you look at Zillow, why are they winning? It's because they've reduced the complexity, right? They're very easy to go find houses and I get to select an agent, boop, right? And they've lowered the cost. Or I don't have to deal with a human, which is what a lot of the younger yeah. generations don't want to do. And so how do, you, how do you combat against that? Well, you can't offer the same thing and expect to get paid more. You have to actually add more value. Yeah. And the way to get paid more value is to layer on whatever service you're going to offer is to add on additional knowledge that they can't get anywhere else, right? It's to become an expert, right? Um, I think Russell Brunson wrote the book, Expert Secrets. I haven't read that, it's a fantastic read. But he talks about this concept of like the way to become an expert is simply to take a, a commodity, or call it real estate marketing services, right? Um, like buyer and seller representation and you layer on unique knowledge on top of that. And now you're no longer a commodity. Um, and so what we're teaching not only ourselves to do as real estate professionals of layering on added knowledge of how to consult and l- added knowledge of having a great flooring specialist of having a financial advisor that as soon as my clients need that, I have the right person for you, right? That's added knowledge through, through, through your network but you're also now training these other professionals how to do the same thing. Cause they're all being all of us, are, like, frankly, any of us that are well-paid professionals in a service-based industry are in the crosshairs of big tech. Big tech is looking for a way 
to replace us with an algorithm and a low paid sales professional and scooping off the top, giving a piece back to the consumer as lower cost. And so the reality is we have to, we can't just be better marketers than them. They've got way more money than we do. We actually have to add more value than an algorithm can. And so the way to do that again is to um, layer in value from other professionals to our value proposition that allows us to be not comparable anywhere else. Well, if I go with this guy, I'm going to get like access to his inner circle, whether it be the contractor or the financial services side. And he's bringing in all this added knowledge that allows them to have every, all their concerns taken care of in one stop. Whereas Zillow is not going to do that, right? They're here to give you a realtor that'll open a door and write a contract for you. So again, I think that's, that's a key to, to defeating big tech is you have to actually be better. You have to have more of a value proposition um, and you have to be able then um, to com you know, communicate that at scale, right? Of, of actually educating people. In fact, that, yeah, we both carry a real estate license, but there's a very different value proposition behind what I do and what others do. And it's this added layer of unique knowledge that part of it's mine, part of it's that I'm pulling from other professionals that I've vetted and brought into my client experience. And similarly, they've brought me into their client experience to where now I've got these added referral sources coming at me. Can you go deeper on that? Can you, can you take it a step further when we're talking about uh, big tech, and, and I just love to use the, the terminology crushing big tech, um, you know, you're going to go, you're going to go above them with knowledge. Let's, let, let's yeah. give some, if you can uh, give a, um, give a more direct specific example of, you know, kind of just to open up the creativity yeah. in the realtor's minds. So again, I think the, the door through which you walk into somebody's life matters a lot. So for example, if somebody finds you online, they're looking at a house, they love the house, and it looks like that realtor is connected to that house, boop, push the button, call co contact agent now, right? Um, or even sell that, like purchase now without an agent, right? They're going to Zillow offers world. Um, you, are, you have positioned yourself in that world to be a commodity. That if they don't, if you don't respond right away, they'll quickly bring up someone else's face right next to that same property. And so what the world has been trained when they look at that is that that the purse, the face there doesn't necessarily matter. What matters is this tech portal experience. I can trust this experience. They'll bring in people that are look to be fairly interchangeable, right? Um, they all seem to have decent reviews and like they're all fairly good. Like they're good enough. Um, and so you, you walk into, into somebody's life with them knowing that you're not the most important thing here, this portal is and the value and information that they bring to me. And at any moment, if you don't perform, I'll just go back to the well and pull somebody else out that will solve that. That's the definition of a commodity where you're easily um, comparable and replaceable. People don't value that. They'll replace you at the minute that you don't provide the service that oftentimes lowers our margins and lowers our quality of life. Like get over here and open this door now, sign this contract now, right? There's no real reason to, to, to treat you different than that. So that's the world that many agents are playing in, right? And I'm not putting it down. I think that, that that's some have built great businesses that way. I just don't think it's long-term sustainable as these portals grow in, in, their, in their power, right? They'll beat influence. you. They'll beat you at that game. Yeah, yeah. I've got um, agents that I coach who, like Zillow used to be a, a, like a great lead source and people respect me. And now, man, I feel like I have a job and Zillow is depending upon kind of what your format is, but I've got, to, I've got to follow up with these agents or they're following up with me saying, have you called these leads yet? And it's like, whoa, what, what happened to my autonomy here, right? What happened to my autonomy? Whereas when you step, when you walk through the door um, into somebody's, into a consumer's life and you've been edified as not replaceable, as really unique and not the typical agent and not just being an expert at marketing and selling homes, but you're expert at managing their wealth in real estate, right? Of being a wealth advisor for somebody's real estate portfolio, for example. And this is the language that someone that they already trust at this level is saying about you. The ball game changes, right? Because now you have, um, you're not easy to replace. They can't go back to the well and find somebody that does that. They've never heard that before. They've never heard anybody describe that way. And it's like, what is that? I want to learn more about that. I, I at least need to respect that and listen to that and see what it is, what the difference is to where now they're getting more to where they're not talking about price. They're talking about value, right? Where people aren't saying, well, what do you charge? Right. And it's, it's not a price about that. It's like, you're asking the wrong question there. Like this half percent is totally irrelevant to the tens of thousands of dollars that you're going to get 
as an ROI when you use my services. Now you gotta be careful about what you promise, right? But consumers are, are, are taught to ask the wrong questions of what do you charge simply because every, all things are similar, all things are common. Why would I not try and get it down lower? But if the value is I'm gonna get not only this higher value proposition now, but, but an ongoing relationship and access to your inner circle of these professionals that will help me build wealth over time, that's a different, right? That's a different conversation. That all happens by being strategic about how you get in conversation and, and the value you offer to those upstream partners. I don't know if I answered your question, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, I guess really just, can you go granular um, with an example of if, if I'm an agent and I come to you and say, okay, uh, everything that you're saying makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of mentioned you know, being that advisor, um, is that kind of where you would go with that description of, hey, you need to bring increased over the top value? Or do you have anything like super like specific that you would say, here's one idea. This is what, this is how I would position yourself so that you are not, uh, you know, kind of lumped in uh, yeah. with that tech because you're not going to compete with the tech. You're not going to compete with speed. I think one of the best ways for the consumer to see a difference in you, number one is, as we've already talked about, as it's coming not from you, it's coming from someone that, with whom they already have a high level of trust and they make a comparison. Okay. So it's the typical agent. So for you, you can imagine if I was a financial advisor and I was saying this about, let's say you, Jeff, right? That uh, the typical agent will be very good at marketing and selling your home. Um, and that's, uh, that's kind of the baseline. That's what we expect from real estate agents. Um, the person I'm going to introduce you to does that. And they have an entire elevated, not just client experience, but value proposition beyond that. They don't work like the typical real estate agent in, in a sense that they're very transactional. They work more like me. I don't have past clients. I work with my clients throughout their entire life to advise them and help them build wealth in the market. This real estate agent does that with your, with your real estate portfolio, that they are gonna add value, not just during this transaction, not just during the next few months, but throughout your life. The value that you'll get by being in conversation with this professional will surpass what you'll experience with anybody else. Yeah, I think it's making a comparison, like this is what's typical, which is what you'll read on all the reviews and everyone's business cards and everyone's websites, right? That's typical. That's not just what you're going to get here. You'll get that for sure. Yeah. Different but you're also going to get this advisor, right? Someone who's really a consultant to help you build wealth over time. That's what you get when you work with this person. Yeah. I love it, man. And it's, it's, I mean, again, it, it comes back to that one word of differentiation and, and um, as, as a real estate agent, as a sales professional of any kind, if you can't sit down and figure that out and it might take you months and years to really truly figure out your true differentiation piece or point or whatever it is that you're going to hang your hat on. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's the career definer. That's when things change for you. And when you can really dial in on that, I, I have a, I have a couple of questions that I want to kind of end with uh, one being um, tell us about the think bigger real estate show. Where can they find it? What do you do? Who are you, what kind of guests do you typically have on the show? Uh, what is that about? And then, you know, one more question after that. Yeah, no, great, great question. So the Think Big Real Estate, Real Estate Show actually started off as um, kind of an arm of my value proposition from the title and escrow industry, right? That how can I offer value to real estate agents at scale? How can I be in conversation with real estate agents that I want to be in business with, but I'm a commodity, right? Um, and it really kind of started off as kind of a pet project around that. And then I fell in love with it. And I realized that if... I can be in conversation with people that are bigger thinkers than I am, then I begin to grow into be that person as well, right? We've all heard this kind of age old adage, right? Which is um, you are the sum average of the five people you spend the most time with. And typically um, the people who were in our community and, you know, down the hall and whatever, they may be great at what they do for a living, but they might not be stretching our thinking. Mm -hmm. And so, um, what that allows us to do is have the opportunity in this digital age is to put ourselves in conversation and be around people, people like yourself, Jeff, that they might not have access to in their local community. So I realized that one of my value propositions um, is number one, I need to be better, right? Which is kind of the whole emphasis of what we're talking about here with the upstream model is number one, you have to be better. You have to be a better product. You can't just be a better marketer of the same product. You actually have to be better. 
And so I set out to be, who, who can I, who can I be in conversation with that are the biggest thinkers out there that actually grow Justin, that make Justin a better product. Um, and in the process, if I were to record that and share that with others, they're going to be a better product as well. And so I'm seeking out kind of the top professionals, specifically in the real estate industry. I oftentimes pull from other industries, but for the most part, focus on our industry. I interview people that are, that are genuinely big thinkers that have really big missions and really big track records of, of, of producing at high levels, not just producing, you know, GCI, but again, producing, you know, impact and producing independence, creating great lives, not just great trophies. And so um, that's who I'm looking to be around and then share that with other people. Uh, people are interested in, in finding that, they can go to my website, justinstoddart.com forward slash podcast. And you'll kind of see kind of the lineup of people that I've had there recently, including people like Grant Cardone, Sharon Srivatsa, and you know, some other big names. Uh, Tristan, Tristan, Ahamada. Tristan Ahamada. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Justin Stoddard, by the way, Stoddard is spelled. So Justin is J-U-S-T-I-N-S-T-O-D-D-A-R-T.com forward slash podcast. I love that. Uh, what would be in a closing thought uh, before we get to the, the book giveaway? Um, you know, what's, what's one last piece of advice you would give to a real estate agent as to how they can think bigger? Yeah. Um, and this is really goes back to my, my mission and passion, which is there is so much more potential in each and every one of us than we can even comprehend. And, and I believe that. And I've started to scratch the surface as I get around people that are doing some amazing things in the world. Um, and, and I would just encourage you that um, to, to kind of lean into that, to spend some time on that. I've got a very specific morning routine that kind of covers four parts of life. One is spiritual. I'll spend an hour in spiritual study, prayer, uh, meditation, journaling, that really helps me to be in pursuit of, of who I am at a soul level. Um, I then spend time on my physical body. It's, you know, our, our spirit lives inside of our body. We better take care of our body. Uh, I spend time on the mental. How do I actually grow my thinking? And then how do I pour into the people that I love the most? So that kind of a four-part morning routine allows me to, to, to kind of lean into that and, and, and be a big thinker. But that's my, that's my message really, is that if, you're, if you don't have the income, the independence, right? It might even be independence from Zillow leads um, and the impact that, that you have, that you have the ability to change it, right? You are not a fixed, uh, a fixed product, right? You're dynamic. You have the ability to grow and change. And if you've got the hunger, then you just simply have to find, go find the right resources. Go find the people that inspire you and light you up and help you to recognize that potential and that are willing to continue to inspire and help you to, to, to become that person, to create the income, the impact, and the independence that you want. It's amazing. Awesome. This has been fantastic. So uh, without further ado, uh, we have this, this little uh, blue book called The Upstream Model that's over your shoulder. For those of you that are watching this on YouTube, you see what I'm talking about. Uh, for everybody else, you're just going to have to trust me. The Upstream Model, tell us, just give us a short snip of what they can expect in the book and then tell us and tell our, our listeners how they can go get a copy. Yeah, so The Upstream Model is... is uh, you know, we took, you know, probably 30 minutes today to talk about the book. Uh, the upstream model goes in depth um, as to what the risks are facing well-paid professionals. The fact that we are all being disrupted and we will be disrupted, our margins and eventually our businesses, if we don't innovate and rise above it. And then it gives a blueprint moving forward as to how to begin to rise above that disruption using the concept of getting your leads from upstream partners um, and increasing your overall identity to that same method and teaches you how to then scale that, how to where you're not um, spending tons of time on a big database trying to get a few referrals, but how to spend time with a few key referrals that give you lots of referrals and then how to scale that using upstream masterminds. Um, so that, that's kind of what's talked about in the book and how to be a bigger thinker. Uh, best way to get the book, there's two ways, um, you know, really that uh, if you want an ebook you know, an electronic copy of the book. If you'll just go to Instagram, find me at Justin Stoddart, DM me ebook. I'll send you a link. You can go get it and start reading it today. Uh, if you want your hands on a, on a hard copy of the book, um, you can just go to upstreammodel.com forward slash book. And uh, you can get a free plus shipping coffee. It's like eight, eight bucks to get the book delivered to your, to your door. Nice. Upstream model is just all in concession. Yep. Upstreammodel.com forward slash book. Got it. That is fantastic. Or go get the ebook. Uh, Justin Stoddart on Instagram. He's on YouTube. He's on LinkedIn. He's on Facebook. 
got the website. It sounds like you're pretty much everywhere. If there was a TikTok logo there, I'd be really impressed. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll find you there one day. Next interview, buddy. I'll be I there. Love it. I love it. Justin, <laughs> it has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, like I said 20 minutes ago, we could have stopped the podcast then uh, because it's not often that we do one of these podcasts and midway through, I'm spewing out homework for the real estate agent. If you weren't paying attention or you chewed out for a second, listen again, rewind it. It's about the between the 25 and 35 minute mark where we specifically talk about what you could do to immediately change your life when, as it comes to your referral partners uh, by using this upstream model. And if you thought that was good, uh, get the damn book. I mean, come on, upstreammodel.com forward slash book. Um, I have a pretty good inclination that it could probably do some things for your business. So uh, Justin, it has been an absolute pleasure. Last thing, if anybody wants to get in touch with you and mentioned all of the social media, where's the best place to connect with you? I got Instagram. I would say DM me on Instagram. It's probably the best way to do that. And uh, then we can, we can interact that way. I'd love to learn more about who you are and how I can serve you. Fantastic. Fantastic, man. It's been a pleasure getting to speak with you and meet you. And uh, hopefully we get to uh, stay in touch. Pleasure, man. Total pleasure. Thanks. Agents Podcasts.